This is TransCat. What is TransCat? TransCat is a safe space. It's a place for respectful conversations about transgender issues. It's a place for queer people to come tell their stories. I'm host Claire McCarthy. Welcome to TransCat. Rowan Jete Knox has a remarkable story to tell, and I feel privileged that he chose to tell that story here on TransCat. Rowan won the 2021 Order of Ottawa for his advocacy work on behalf of trans and non-binary youth. Before transition, he was named Chatelaine Magazine's Woman of the Year in 2019 and one of their top 25 women of influence in 2020. As we mention repeatedly throughout our conversation, Rowan has published two memoirs, Love Lives Here, made the finals of the 2020 Ottawa Book Awards, and was longlisted for Canada Reads 2020. One Sunny Afternoon was released this past fall. Rowan Jete Knox, welcome to Transcat. I, I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you. Um, after watching uh, social media feeds and and posts, I, I really wanted to just have a conversation. So welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Like it's it's been a long time coming. We have tried and tried to make this happen for a while, and I'm glad we're finally making it happen. Darn you, real world. Real um, world getting in the way of our podcasting. So rude. Honestly. You have been posting regular updates on your medical transition. So I thought we could start there. What what day is this on T? You know what I do? I've lost track of days, which is good, I think, actually. Um, but it is uh week seven. So I just I just sort of wow. celebrated, if you will, like uh my seventh week on T. And uh it's been quite a journey so far. Oh, congratulations. So so Physically, at seven weeks, what are you feeling? So the first thing I noticed right away, the first day I took it, uh, was this calmness that uh, came over me. I just felt so calm. It's like all the noise in my head shut down. And I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to feel like. I get it now. And I, I've heard that from so many trans people, no matter what direction they're going in transition wise, uh, who feel like that when they start HRT. So I got to experience that firsthand. But I also uh, ended up in a in a situation where things progressed really rapidly, like right away, I noticed like day three, my voice got kind of scratchy. Um, and I thought I was wow. coming down with a cold, but it was the beginning of, of, of the vocal cord changes. So that has happened very quickly. It continues to happen. I'm not, um, anywhere I think where I'm going to end up, but if, if the first seven weeks is any indication, my goodness, I'm going to have quite a deep voice, which I'm excited about. And I have been, I've been a regular exerciser for a decade, over a decade now. I work out several times a week. I do, you know, strength training and all sorts of different things. I'm so strong all of a sudden. <laughs> wow. It's wild. Yeah. I do planks. No problem. I do push-ups, No problem. Like everything, everything has changed. All these things I've struggled with for, for years. I'm like, Oh, that's not fair. So yeah. <laughs> so there again, things sort of clicking into place going, yes, this is, this is the way I want my body to function. This is, this is me. The voice thing, I'm so jealous of because, of course, it doesn't work in the other direction. All of my transmasculine friends, I, I am constantly just in that space between I'm happy for you and I hate you <laughs> because right. it doesn't doesn't work on estrogen. I know. I know it is. It is frustrating. And I, I've i had a lot of sentiment from people that way, which I completely understand, um, because one of the things that I struggle with when I go out right now is I'll, I'll go out in the world and people don't necessarily know how to read me. I occasionally get sir or I get nothing at all. But the minute I open my mouth, I get mammed. And so I understand oh, wow. the frustration from the from the other side of that. It, it's it it's very it's very dysphoric. I I say to my trans women friends or my trans femme friends, the thing that a lot of trans men have to deal with 
is when it comes to bottom surgery. It's mm-hmm. just not where I, I want I want it to be, right? It's not, it's 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 a very difficult option. It's multiple surgeries. It's you know, so yeah. So the the when you say it's not where you want it to be, the the medical system it, currently in terms of what is physically possible that's what you're right exactly exactly like yes bottom surgery is possible and uh, i know i have some trans guy friends who are very happy with uh you know who, who had surgery and are happy with the results when i look at what i would want from that at this point it's not where i'd like where i'd like it to be and it's not something that i'd want to do so as dysphoric as i might feel it's, you know, yeah. medically not possible to get what I want right now. So that's the frustration. Uh, whereas I've seen it go in the other direction with several of my trans women friends, and most are very happy with the results, right? Because it, it is so much more advanced. It's, I think it's, it's easier, it's easier to go in than go out, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but it speaks to something that I'm not sure cis people really understand, which is that transition is not a monolith and it's different for every single person in terms of what you want and what medically is possible and pre-existing conditions i i have a, a trans masculine friend who has a heart problem and so hrt has always been off the table for him and that's you know so the, it comes with its own set of, of frustrations as well as as joys how about emotionally? How, uh, what are you feeling differently with the tea? You said you felt calmer. I definitely feel calmer. There's no question. I feel okay. calmer overall. At the same time, I'm 47 years old and I am going through like boy puberty now, if you will. Right? Oh, I feel like, you know, oh. and, and I, I, you know, I'm going through what my teenage sons went through. And I've had to apologize to them a lot because like, I, I didn't know how hungry you get. I'm so hungry. I want to eat everything. And I, you know, I get moody. I, I want to brood. I like brooding right now. It's like my thing. I go off on my own and I just kind of brood in a corner and, and, uh, and everything's kind of dark and moody, you know, and then I get over it. But yeah, I, like my, my emotions are very different than they used to be. And then in contrast, because I'm early transition. I'm going through teen like male pu- puberty and menopause at the same time, right? Because oh, my 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 God. system is shutting down. You know, the system that has been chugging along for many years is now starting to shut down both because of age and because I now it's it's ramped up because I just started T. So I'm <laughs> I'm 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 dealing with the two at the same time and wow. I just I, I I stop every day and I take a moment and I just I I I congratulate myself on holding it together as well as I am given the you know the the juxtaposition of hormones the war of hormones in in my body right now and I I did want to acknowledge both to the listeners and, and to you that we're probably going to be talking about some difficult things. Uh, as we go through here. And and yeah. so for the listeners, uh, I want you to be forewarned that subjects might might get a little stressful, but also you, Rowan, I, I just, I really want you to know that you're safe here. Answer what you like, take care of yourself first and foremost. But this this new book, One Sunny Afternoon, does go to some very dark places. And I, I think we're probably going to need to address that. Before we do though, you rock that blue suit. The first picture I saw of you post-transition was in a blue suit, which I spent decades in a suit and tie. And A, I could never look that good. And B, the blue suit I could never have pulled off. So I need to say that to you up front, how good you looked in that blue suit. Oh, hey, thank you. I, you know, it's in that, that euphoria shines through. It's like when I see a lot of my trans women friends, you know, wearing a beautiful dress for a first time, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I, I get that. I get that so hard now because that's what it felt like. And when I posted that picture, I knew I took that picture. I was at a wedding. I took that picture and, or rather my partner to that picture. And I said, that's the picture. When I come out, that is the picture I'm going to use. It, it has made such um 
a difference in my life to be able to look at photos and start to see myself? Part of the difficulty you you were just describing the uh, the hormonal war going on inside of of dealing with menopause and with with male puberty at the same time, but you're going through that while you're immersed in oh it's my show I can say shitstorm if I want of public reaction to you and that comes out of a long context of things that we should probably just touch on to let the listeners know. So you put out your first book, Love Lives Here, and you begin, I guess, by talking about the fact that uh, you have this this blog, Maven of Mayhem. I had Maven of Mayhem uh, from 2006. I started okay. that blog. I started it because I was running a daycare out of my home full time and also was pregnant with my third child. And I needed somewhere to put all of my frustration. And I thought, <laughs> what, what a what better <laughs> place than an anonymous blog. So I started to blog. It's, and a lot uh, of response it, to that. You you had a, a lot of followers. People really seemed to... to buy into the tone and the messages what were, what were your numbers like if you don't mind oh, me asking oh gosh it really varied i mean it's like anything right it's like if you have a youtuber who you know posts one video and they get 500 people who view it and they post another one they get 5 million people who view it right so it would really vary based on topic and shares and all of that sort of thing but overall i had a pretty steady following where thousands of people would read read me every week thousands and thousands of people i wasn't the blog ass if you know who that is by any means um you know there, there are some people out there who were sort of blogging superstars and i wasn't that but uh but i had i had enough of a following where when i you know walked down the street in my in my hometown of ottawa I would, I would, you know, get stopped sometimes and people would be like, oh, I love your blog. And that was, that was funny because initially that blog was anonymous. And then over time I started to share it with friends and then friends told, you know, and it just sort of, and then I just sort of became this little local public figure, but people were reading it all over the world at the time. So yeah, I had I had a nice a nice little nice little um creative outlet for a number of years. And then as we sort of said at the beginning of this, the real world interferes and uh, one of your children comes to you with some information. Yeah, so in 2014, our middle child at the time wrote us an email. And so at the time, I should say, you know, if you were if you were to sort of ask me at the time, what did my family look like from the outside? I would have told you that we were a mom and a dad and three boys because, you know, we lived in the suburbs. I worked part time. My partner worked full time. And we had these three kids who were school aged back then. And we had one child who was quite unhappy. And I could never figure out why we even moved from one province to another, uh, which sounds very drastic, but it was really just across the river. We moved from Quebec over to the Ontario side um, to live in Ottawa. And uh, we did that in large part to access mental health care for that child because they were really struggling. They eventually, through the right supports, were able to figure out for themselves that they were trans. And so they wrote us an email and said, at the time, we had to remember this is 2014, they said they were a trans girl. More recently, over the last few years, they've said, you know, actually non-binary fits me better. But yeah, all we knew, you know, what really matters in this in, in this situation is one of our children wasn't cis. And and we had to learn to support that child, what that meant and 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 what what we could do at 11 years old uh, to support this little person who was clearly really struggling inside. And it made a lot of sense once once we figured out what was going on, once they were able to tell us it made so much sense. But yeah, then I have this blog where I've been writing about my family and people all know my family. And so what do you do in that situation when this 11 year old comes out and it's, you know, it's early, it's early days, right? People aren't uh, really talking about supporting trans kids for the most part. There are very, very few stories like that out there. Yeah. Well, in 2014, that's the year that Laverne Cox is on the cover of Time 
with the headline, the, the transgender tipping point. So that really is the start of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there were a, a, a couple of examples of trans kids, Jazz Jennings being one of them, right? Her family mm-hmm. had been vocal for a long time and had taken a lot of heat because of it. Uh, but there there were other other than that, there were very, very few. And so this poor little kid went out looking for examples of families who affirmed their trans child and came up short. And instead on Reddit and, you know, on YouTube and on places like that, they were finding a lot of stories of young people saying, I came out to my family as trans. It did not go well. And that could be everything from I'm still a minor and my parents have refused to let me transition or, you know, my, you know, I'm, I'm 17, 18, 19. My parents have kicked me out of the house or I'm disowned. So these are the stories that they were getting. And so they were really afraid to tell us. I'm glad they did. And we did absolutely rally around um, our child and support them. But it did lend the question, like, what do you do with a blog? And so I was going to shut it down. And our 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 kiddo said, absolutely not. Please don't do that because um, I want the next kid who is looking for what it looks like to have a supportive family to be able to find this. So we became one of the first families to very openly discuss supporting our child. What was the response among people who subscribed and loved your blog to this new information. You posted a, uh, a a very moving piece that, you know, that your, that your, your child had transitioned or was beginning transition. What was the reaction from that base? Overall, very positive. I think the reason is because I had established a really strong connection with my community. I was a person who was always in the comments replying to people. People would email me. I'd get back to them. I wish I could still do that these days. It's just way too busy. But at the time, I was able to do that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, and there was there was a sense of community. And so when our child came out, I think what that did is rather than read a news story about some family you don't know about a child you don't know, people knew felt like at least they knew us. They knew a part of us. I had been sharing a part of our story for a long time. And so to them, this is a child they already knew and this was a family they already knew. So it was much harder to judge it. It was much harder. It was it was so much easier to go, oh my goodness. Well, I really, I really like this writer and I really like this family. And I I, you know, I have to support this child. Like I think there was a lot of that sentiment. Yeah. Well, there's a sense of investment, right? In the in the story you were telling, people felt a, a sense of ownership, but at least a sense of engagement and investment in what you were talking about. Well, that's just it. Exactly. And then it took off from there because that post, which I tried to just really, I was so nervous writing it. It took me forever. I don't remember how long it took me, but it took me an exorbitant amount of time to write that and, uh, and, and get it as right as I could. I still made tons of, you know, what I look back on as, you know, errors. I didn't get everything right, but I mean, I did the best I could at the time with the knowledge that I had, which is what we all do. And Mm -hmm. I tried to, sort of slip it under the radar during an award show so that I just like posted it um, while I think the Emmys were going on or something. I was like, this is perfect. So people aren't even going to notice it. It went massively viral. I mean, it was just everywhere. And the response largely was very positive. And so that, that sort of catapulted our family story into a much more public space than it had been before you mentioned in um i think it's love lives here that you were you were were working with your child with microsoft on a campaign uh and an educational campaign uh so that doesn't get much bigger than microsoft yeah microsoft came to us in i think it was 2015 and they had been reading our story they got somebody in their marketing you know, area sort of read our, our story and thought this is really lovely. And maybe what we need to do is they, like they basically formed an entire ad campaign around us. So they had our story and they collected a few other stories that were really lovely uh, people from various backgrounds from around Canada. And then they, they just wanted to showcase 
learning online, right? Like, and so they found people who use their own stories to, to educate people. And it was, it was great. It was a really lovely thing to work on. And uh, they, they treated our child very respectfully. Now, as you're, as you're doing this, as you're scrambling to get the information you need to support your your child and to as you say you want to say the right things you want to write the correct things you don't want to do anything hurtful your spouse comes to you and offers some information <laughs> well i kind of pulled it out of my spouse is more yeah <laughs> more what happened there um <laughs> there there were many hints dropped that i did not pick up on because in my opinion there's no way that could happen but yes about a year and a half after our child came out just as we're settling into this new routine and we're doing, you know, uh, our kiddo and, and, you know, is doing more public work. We're doing more public work as a family and, and, and the dust has settled because we did lose people. People did walk out of our lives. People, there were people who were just not cool with, with us supporting our trans child, but overall, you know, it was, it was, it was okay. We were in a good place. You know, my, my spouse was really miserable too. And we had been together for over 20 years. We had been married for 18 years at the time. And I finally just wanted to sit down and have a really sort of frank discussion about what was going on. So we went out on this date night that was just, (laughs) it was a mess. (laughs) And it was such a mess. I tried really hard, but it was a terrible date. And on the way home, I started asking the really big questions, you know, things like, is it, are you, you know, we've been together since we were teenagers. Is it, you know, is it, is it me? Are you just not happy with me anymore? And, and the answer was like, no, I love you very much. And I said, okay, is it the chaos of having a family? And we just have, you have a child who's just gone through transition. And, and the answer was like, no, no, I, I love our family. This predates you and the kids. So I started to ask questions I didn't really want an answer to, like, um, you know, are you gay? And the answer was like, no, I'm not. No, that's not what's going on. And I said, okay, well, are you a woman? Because I didn't know what else to ask. I mean, I was I was like out of ideas at this point, right? And the answer was complete silence, just complete silence, followed by I don't even know how long because it's like time stood still for a while. A very quiet. I can't talk about that. And so then I knew, and uh, we were driving home at the time from this date night. We were almost home and the kids were waiting for us. And I was like, well, we can't go home right now. Like we have to keep talking. So we had the most important conversation of our entire lives in a Walmart parking lot. (laughs) Just so funny, really. Yeah. Worst date night ever. Worst date night ever. Very important date night, but worst date night ever. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I think any yeah. date night that ends up in a Walmart parking lot, you, you're really not in the top 10. <laughs> so. It's true. It's not going to make your top 10. That's that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So she came out and that also made a lot of sense in hindsight. But it was it was a it was a big adjustment. It was actually more of an adjustment to have a partner come out as trans than it was to have a child come out as trans. The the issue actually in, in that case wasn't that she was a woman. I had no issues with the fact that she was a woman. In fact, I had historically only been attracted to women. I had dated guys, but really because I felt like I had to. It was, you know, a good, good, solid Catholic upbringing. But, but, you know, it was like, that was, that was just, you know, I'm a Gen X and Gen Xers, this is what we were taught. We, we, we were not taught that we could be queer. But I, so I dated, I, I was like, I am a woman and I date, you know, I'm supposed to date men, but I, my attractions were, were very much to, to women. So I was not upset that she was a woman by any means. I was worried that, well, two things, one, that the stress of transition would be really too much on her and that this miserable person who had been miserable for so long. And I was feeling kind of at my wits end with how unhappy she always was as, as terrible as that sounds, but you have to imagine two decades over two decades of that. Right. Right. Um, I was craving some more 
light and lightness and happiness in my life. I was worried that that wasn't going to do it. That's, you know, which clearly I was wrong about. But I was also worried about the repercussions in our everyday life. You know, would she be able to keep her job? You know, would would our families abandon us? Like there were so many questions like that. So it was it was a, it was a lot. It was a lot. How are the kids going to react? You know, that's how are the all kids? these oh, questions? So worried about the kids. I was, yeah. you know, really worried. As it turns out, the kids were wonderful. The kids, when she did sit them down, we sat them down a few days later to tell them, and they were so supportive. They were, they were wonderful with her, you know. And there were some feelings, uh, good feelings, hard feelings. Uh, adjustment feelings, changes like that are, are can be difficult, right? Especially because our society is so, uh, we put people in the boxes and then we create all these stories about who this person is based on the box that society has placed them in. So having to say to a child, the box that you have this person in, that this person is your father, that, it, you know, that their pronouns are he, him, and that this is their name, that's all going to change. That, that can take a little bit of adjustment. You bring up the notion of people being put in boxes, of, of expectations that society puts on us, however it is we present. And to that end, I was wondering if you would be willing to... i got to find my glasses. You taking them off was a mistake. <laughs> ah, That's why I have mine on right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is One Sunny Afternoon. This is the new book, page 187. And people right. should, since we're coming up on some sort of a gift giving holiday, as I understand it, people should rush out and buy multiple copies of this, right? To give to, uh, well, everyone they know. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yes, yes. You should definitely, definitely get some copies of this and share it. I think there's some learning for everybody in this book, whether, you know, no, no matter who you are. All right. When we bought our first house, it officially made me a young mother, a newlywed and a homeowner by the age of 22. These felt like giant shoes to fill for someone so young. Every other adult in our new development had at least five years on me, and I felt I, like I had to prove we belonged there. I was grateful to get on the property ladder at such a young age, but that gratitude was tied to feeling like an imposter on my own street, playing a role that didn't fit me. Just six years earlier, I was living in a shelter. Only two years earlier, nurses and doctors had treated me like a second-class citizen while I was in labor with a potentially life-threatening medical condition. Now, rather quickly, I had moved from poverty to middle class, from homeless to homeowner. I felt like I was pretending to be something I wasn't, living a life I didn't belong in, and everyone would soon figure it out if they hadn't already. I tried to be society's ideal version of mom, partner, friend, neighbor, playgroup goer, and preschool volunteer. I spent an exorbitant amount of energy trying to prove my worth when there was no need to. I had value, but I couldn't see it. I had wrapped it up in what everyone else thought of me, just as I always did. Because without their approval, I surmised I was nothing. That is an experience that I have lived as well, where you're doing the best you can. Um, you're, you're trying to live up to those expectations but the knowledge inside that, not that it's false, not that you're not the person you're telling these loved ones you are, but that there is something going on inside that is different from what they perceive. That, for me, turned out to be devastating, that duality. So I, I really responded to that passage. And you you talk in both of your books about your tendency to be a people pleaser. I'm a massive people pleaser. Well, I, I I now say I'm a recovering people pleaser with the occasional little slip up. <laughs> <laughs> because there's there's a line, right? There's there's the sort of healthy this is a good person because they're aware of the folks around them and they're, you know, they're considerate and they're compassionate and all these things that that we admire. But there's a line beyond which you're not being healthy. And it, it sounds like we have both stepped over that line. That line is when you chronically say yes, when you should be saying no to me. This is where my line is. It is when I get exhausted and I even begin to get resentful because I don't get enough time to myself. It is when I am doing something good for someone out of fear 
because I'm worried that if I don't do that good thing, if I don't do the thing that's going to make them happy, that they're not going to love me anymore or they're going to leave me. They're going to think less of me and I'm going to be all alone because at the core of that, I think people pleasing, a lot of it is about abandonment. Somewhere a long time ago, somebody taught us that we had to earn our love. We had to earn other people's love. We had we did, we were not worthy of love just as we are. And so we spend a lifetime trying to earn that love from other people. The the weird thing about people pleasing though, and I also talk about this in the book, is that when we're doing that, we're not presenting our authentic selves to be loved right? We're, we're creating a facade. We're creating an illusion of who we are rather than just showing up as who we are. And what I've learned from starting to show up as I am is I, I am just as lovable, just like this, even when I say no sometimes, even when I'm not perfect, even when I have those, you know, those situations where I am I, I have to prioritize myself. What I found it was that it was this this vicious spiral for me in that, you know, what you're describing that I, I had this persona that I was inhabiting that was mostly me, but not 100% me. And so I would feel unworthy of love. But when I would get it, you know, I've, I've been married, I've been a parent, when I would get those things, or even professional accolades, somebody would say, wow, you're, you're really good at your job. I immediately distanced myself from that facade and said, well, you're complimenting. And I, I couldn't say this out loud, but it, I felt like you're complimenting something that's not entirely real, not entirely me. And so I'm not going to listen to your love. And I'm not going to listen to your compliments and I'm certainly not going to take them to heart because I know I don't deserve that. Yeah. Yeah. Because you never end up getting what it is you're looking for. It It, it is. It, it's a really tough situation. Then you have to feel, you feel like you have to work even harder the next time to earn something. But that's, that's also, you know, that can, that can also be imposter syndrome, right? Where this, there's this idea that any minute now, somebody's going to find out that I'm a fraud, that I don't deserve the things that I have, whether that be uh, the love that I have or the recognition that I have or the support that I have or the you know uh, career that I have, whatever it might be, and that it'll be taken away from me. Um, it, 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 I think it stems from a lot of the same thing. It really does. At this point, you draw a great deal of online response. You've now had a child and a um, and a spouse come out as trans. Uh, you're working hard to be supportive of both of them. And for me, I found it surprising. I mean, I, I ex would expect that someone in that situation would receive the wave of hatred that we all do that trans is not a thing. And for me, I, I was speaking at a public library this past year and the town's Facebook page included comments about, well, since when did we start inviting pedophiles to the library? You know, and right, there, right. there are those stereotypical responses of hate that that's just baked into the internet. But you started getting pushback from folks within the community. Tell me a little bit about the nature of that that wave of pushback. At the time, I was presenting as a cisgender woman, and I was telling the story of my family that had two trans people in it. I was telling that story because I was best positioned to tell it within my family. And also, my family believed, because I had their full support um, in, in the writing of this book, my family believed that telling it from my perspective as a partner and a parent could help other partners and parents and therefore end up helping trans people as a whole to have more supportive family. Because there were a number of memoirs and stories told through various forms of media from the trans perspective, but there weren't a lot of them told from a partner or a parent's perspective, from a family member's perspective. And so overall, the book was 
Well, first of all, it was it was very well received publicly. It was it, it made the bestseller list for several weeks. Um, it was it 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 got a lot of recognition. Made a lot of the best books list of the year, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which was very surprising to me. I thought it was going to be a niche book, and it ended up being sort of a you know an international success. But it did ruffle some feathers, and the reason for that is there were some trans people who felt like I had absolutely no right to be writing about trans lives at all, that that should be reserved for trans people only, and that I was taking space away from trans people by telling this story. They have the right to their opinions. That is absolutely fine. As it turns out, it, I'm not exactly cis, but but I understand the sentiment I don't understand the sentiment in terms of writing about my own family with the full support of that family, but I understand the sentiment overall, sure. And constructive criticism is fine. I, I get a lot of constructive criticism and I'm good with it because it helps me grow. It pushes me. It feels terrible. It feels uncomfortable. I'm not somebody who who loves criticism. I'm not somebody who has like innately. I get very anxious when I hear criticism, but I can deal with it. And I've I've been somebody who can I have publicly apologized for mistakes many times and I have grown from them. What happened, however, was that this it may have started as uh, constructive criticism, although it wasn't ever directed at me. It was always around me. People were just talking about me. But it, it very quickly morphed into what a terrible person I was and that I was this greedy cis woman who was taking money from trans people. Trans people were going hungry. And and here I was making, I don't know, they, they really thought I made tons of money. I clearly... Uh, everyone needed to learn a little bit more about Canadian nonfiction publishing because I was not making mad bank. So, <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> so at this point, you're not a yacht owner, you're saying? No, no. Okay. Even to this okay. day, I'm not a yacht owner. <laughs> uh, not not even close. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I I really don't make a lot of money in publishing. That's unless unless you are a highly successful author. And uh, in my particular field in memoir, it's very difficult to make uh, even even uh, a living wage, let alone, you know, anything else. And I have ended up making a living wage, but it's, you know, it's definitely not glamorous. But but back then, I certainly wasn't making a lot of money, but there were there was a lot of talk about how I, you know, I was this really terrible person. I was a narcissist. I was, um, you know, I was exploiting my child and controlling my wife and, you know, and that I was, I was just taking the mic away from trans people and taking all their opportunities. And it just spiraled into this a horrific week of callouts and pylons and and I couldn't I I I you know it was it was 2020 it was the first wave of the pandemic this was in May and we were all in a bad place I want to just say I think overall collectively as a society I think we were all really stressed I was very stressed I had also one of my best friends had just lost her child to cancer a couple of weeks before and uh, and that was horrific. And and the grieving process, anyone who lost anybody during the early parts of COVID, the grieving process is interrupted because you can't have funerals. You can't you can't see people when they're when they're, you know, to say goodbye. Most of the time there were a lot of things going on. So there was a, there was a lot. And I talk about that in, in more detail in the book. But I was in a really bad place, a very bad place already. And I begged the Internet to just give me some space. I said, I can address all of this. I'm happy to do it, um, but I just need some space right now. And the comment that broke me, I think the hardest was um, somebody on Twitter said, your grief is nothing compared to what trans women experience. Trans women experience far more grief than you'll ever understand. So suck it up, basically. That's when I left Twitter. And that's when I started to spiral down because people wouldn't leave me alone even after I left Twitter because it all started on Twitter. They tagged me on Facebook. They found me on Instagram. And I had to be online for work. I still had to do mm -hmm. advocacy, but it just, it was this huge pile on. One of the, you taught me a word that I was not familiar with before. You got doxxed. 
Yeah. Yeah. So doxing. So that that didn't happen, thankfully, from within the trans community. But doxing is essentially when somebody posts your your public information or your personal information publicly, things like your address or your phone number or the school that your children go to. In my case, it was the schools that my children went to. Um, it's 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 frightening. You know, I mean, a lot of a lot of things like that are um are are really scary to families, to individuals, but especially when you have kids. So there's this just tsunami of of hate bearing down on your family. And you, as you said, end up in a very dark place. And I was wondering if you would allow me to read with you, knowing that my positivity begot more positivity only fueled the vibes I was giving off. On those good days, And in those moments, I really was that happy, and I exuded it freely. Friends came to see me when they needed cheering up. They would invite me out knowing that I would make them laugh when we were together. When someone tells you they feel better about life after they spend time with you, that's an honor. I can't imagine feeling that way now. Over the past few days, I crossed a wide bridge of difficult emotions to get to where I am. My happiness turned to distress, anxiety, and sadness. It turned to tremors in my hands, sleepless nights, and racing thoughts. I welcome this nothingness, this numbness. It relieves me from the immense pressure I've been under. It tells me I can stop fighting now and finally rest. It whispers that I don't need to keep going anymore. We can put an end to this. Doesn't that feel good to hear? There is a way out. Let me show you. I make my way out of bed, knowing this is the last time I will ever lie in it. I get dressed, knowing this is the last time I'll be picking out my clothes. I pet the dog to say goodbye. The kids and I found Blue in a shelter in 2017. He was scrawny and anxious with what looked like a cigarette burn on the top of his head. But I could tell he just needed a little kindness and security to be the perfect family pet. I love this dog. Blue looks at me and I know he loves me back. I'm not going away because nobody loves me, I want to tell him. I've just finally accepted what I've been told my entire life. I'm not deserving of that love. I've never been deserving of it. I don't bring people happiness. I bring them anger and disgust. I've heard that message loud and clear many times in my life. I'm a terrible person. Now that the veil has been lifted and I see myself the way they see me, I can't continue to live. I I have been in that moment as well. Yeah. I, I have reached a breaking point. And um, so you're not alone. How did you successfully get out of that moment, out of that darkness? I still ask myself that question today. I still don't exactly know what did it, but I wrote that chapter very shortly after I felt that way. Uh, Once I was just on the other side of safety and was getting the help that I needed because I wanted to make sure that I could capture that moment well for people who may have never been there and need to know what other people are going through in those times. But I went downstairs And I was faced with two options. And one of them was to go in one direction and end my life. And one was to go in the other direction and possibly save it by getting in the car and driving myself to the hospital. And at the very last minute, with what I believe was maybe a little extra push from the universe, I ended up getting in the car and driving myself there and going into the hospital and asking them to help keep me safe. And I am forever grateful that that is the path I chose and that the help that I received there was so good. It it was the best decision I ever made, I think, really. I mean, it's um, it, it was so close and I didn't see any way out at the time. And I talk about it because I know what it feels like to be in that moment now. And I know a lot of other people have been there, yourself included. And I think what people need to see is that life can get a lot better 
right? From that moment, yes. that can be the death of something. It wasn't my death, but in a way, it was the death of this this pain. It was sort of the 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 start of of being able to figure out what was going on and how to heal from it and how to rebuild my life in a better way. And so I'm really glad it, it sounds weird to say that now, but I'm so grateful. I'm so glad that that happened because who I've become as a result is much more authentic and a much happier person. The, the image that I've had for myself is sort of a, a Viking funeral where I, I put all of that pain into a boat and set it off the shore and, and lit it on fire. And before I transitioned, I was convinced that there was nothing left. If you took all the pain, there's nothing else to me but that. And, you know, right. everything else is a defense mechanism, a, a coping strategy. There is nothing but pain. And I was afraid if I did that, that that would be the end. But it, it turned out that I could stand on the shore and watch that that part of me sail away in flames and I could still be here. And that, that was a huge surprise to me. It is amazing what happens when we're able to start healing from the trauma, because I, I really believe, and I know I'm not alone in this, there is trauma in being closeted as a queer person. There's trauma in being closeted and having to live a life that isn't true to you. And being able to heal from that and the other things that I went through, because there were there were a number of things that I cover in the book and a number of things I did not mention in the book um, that led me to be diagnosed with a complex trauma disorder. When I was able to start healing from it, I discovered that this is the person I've always been on the inside. He was just hidden way deep down. He was scared. And all of these, as you said, defense mechanisms, all these ways of living, of not living so much as surviving, right? Survival mechanisms that a lot of us have, have, um, have developed over time because our brains and our bodies were trying to keep us safe from the pain and, 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 and the fear, you know, once a lot of that is peeled back, what a difference it makes. It really is. One of the things that that you mention in, in each of the books is that the brain, the human brain prioritizes negative experiences as a, as a survival technique. Um, and I, I hadn't really thought of that before, but it certainly in reflection is the way I've lived my life. I, I hang on to the things I screwed up on. I hang on to the bad experiences and the rest tends to fade. Tell me about how that that works for you. The brain is so cool. I had to do a lot of research, not just for the book. I went into more depth for the book, but I had to learn a lot about trauma and a lot about how brain development because my my type of trauma is uh complex cpt or complex ptsd cptsd which is not yet technically a diagnosis but essentially what my psychiatrist said i have it's not in the dsm-5 but they're hoping to put it in the dsm-6 the dsm is the diagnostics manual that people use to diagnose mental illnesses and disorders so it is a form of ptsd but it stems from repeated trauma over time and it literally shapes your brain like my brain brain is a different brain because of you know it is it is a, ba a brain that was formed partially in trauma because of what i went through but i had to figure out how to retrain the parts that i can retrain and also understand why it does some of the things it does so i could be kinder to myself in those moments where i have trauma reactions so what i learned was that humans and i'm sure other animals are 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 programmed instinctively to learn from bad experiences. So if you let's say you're all sitting around a fire back in the 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 cave people days if you will and you know you burn yourself on the flame you're going to remember that and how it felt and how, you know how painful that was and how long it took to heal you're going to remember that experience 
far more than you remember the hundreds of times where you cooked over a fire, no problem. And that is to keep us safe. Right. So right. all of those negative experiences that we have in our in our in our lifetime, we we hold on to those to keep us safe. It's just the way that our, our brains do. But unfortunately, sometimes it causes more problems than it's worth. Speaking of trauma, the hairspray story. Uh, oh, yeah. The hairspray is, story. It, it happened twice. Um, so for people who haven't read my books, I talk about it in the first book a little bit. And I talk about it in the second book as well. There were a couple of girls. I went to elementary school with them, grade school, depending on where you're listening. And they were always bullies. They were always mean to me. And they were mean to other people too, but I was one of their main targets. And they thought it would be really funny when we all got to high school. So the way that high school works in Quebec, or at least the way it did work when I was a child, was you went from grade six and then grade seven, you're in high school all the way to grade 11. So you're now in, there's no middle school. There's no, you know, so it was just like, now we're in uh -huh. high school. So we're, we're interacting with kids who are much older and the grade sevens, grade eights are trying to make a bit of a name for themselves. Right. Because, you know, they want to, fit in. They don't want to be bullied by all these older kids. And here I am already trying to excuse their behavior. There's no excuse for what they did, but I'm trying, I have always tried to understand where people were coming from in my own way. They decided it would be really funny since people were already targeting me, um, as to, to go outside, get a bunch of people outside the front of the school during one of our breaks. I think it was lunch. And they, they brought hairspray and they very quickly whipped the hairspray out and they sprayed the back of my sweater and they threw matches at me. They kept lighting matches and striking matches and throwing them at me and chasing me down until one of them caught the back of my sweater. And I sort of went up in flames. My sweater uh, went up in flames. I was very, very lucky. I did the stop, drop, roll thing and it went out right away and I wasn't seriously injured but traumatized. I mean, somebody just set me on fire. And I think the reaction of the kids around me, I don't remember a lot of it, but it, it felt very mixed. Like, I think at first it was sort of a funny thing till it actually happened. And then everyone was just sort of standing there and looking at me. And it was so embarrassing. I was covered in grass. I was covered in leaves. I was covered, you know, and, and, and these girls were laughing and it was, it was a terrible experience. Those are the types of experiences that that shape us, right? That you remember that people can be that cruel. You remember that people can be that, you know, and, and in my first book, In Love Lives Here, I talk about running into one of these girls at the grocery store. So I'm at the grocery store. I've just moved back to my hometown of Elmer. I'm I'm at the grocery store and I, I run into one of these girls and she is you know, she's, she, she's with her child. Who's about the same age as mine at the time, maybe three or four years old. I decided, you know what? We're, we're grown ups now. We're both parents. I'm going to go say hi. And she treated me terribly. I went to say hi. I tried to connect with her a little bit. She seemed angry to see me. She seemed resentful. I mean, she obviously dealt with consequences as a result and I changed schools. So I don't know what those consequences were, but uh, yeah, she was not happy to see me and she treated me terribly. So some people change and some people never change. <laughs> and the moral of our story. Yeah. Yep. Yep. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words from Rowan Chetanox. <laughs> How do they let me write books? You have all the wisdom, apparently. <laughs> um, let me let me segue off into something less uh, traumatic. So you've had now with yourself three experiences of medical transition. You know, your your child, your spouse, and yourself. Uh, for somebody from the states, what is, what is transitional healthcare like in Canada? Because we we Americans tend to think of it as more of a utopia, considering how dystopic our system is down here. Our medical system is divided into provinces. So all provinces provide some level of care for trans people. And uh, so even going further back than that, we have laws on the books federally that protect, we are protected class here. So gender identity and gender expression are both protected classes in Canada now. Uh, my family took part in sort of 
helping that get through. We took a very small role. There were a number of people involved that were far more involved than we were, but um, living in Ottawa made it a little easier since that's the capital of Canada. Um, but we we definitely did uh, did sort of see that through and it was a, a momentous, uh, momentous thing when it happened. But all uh, all provinces and territories in Canada have some level of gender affirming care, but it does vary per province. Hmm. Most trans people in Canada can access care. Um, and some of that care is provided through the province. So you don't pay for it. So uh, you can see a specialist free of charge. Um, you can often get certain surgeries, but not all free of charge or very limited fees. For example, we have a weird thing in Ontario where if I want top surgery, which I do, I can get the top surgery covered by the province, but not the contouring, which is a very important part of top surgery for men. So then I have right. to either, you know, use private insurance through work or pay for it out of pocket to get that right so it's things like that that are lacking or um you know um ffs is not for example is not usually covered there are a number of things like that that are not you know uh breast augmentation you know top surgery for for trans women um you know is only covered under circum certain circumstances so there's things like that you know but being able so in my personal experience I went to my family doctor and I said, I'm trans. We talked a little bit about what I needed to get out of medical transition. And he felt that it would be best to send me to a specialist who does a lot of this stuff as, as their full-time job. But that if the wait was too long for me, he would be happy to get the process started for me. So there are some people who just go to their medical doctors and the doctors have training. There are some doctors who are like, I won't do that. So it's kind of all over the place. And then we have gender clinics, mm -hmm. of course, like a lot of places. So we do have gender clinics and we have gender clinics for trans youth as well. Yeah, it does sound like an improvement as as we're watching state after state deny health care to trans youth. And now some of them have moved on to uh, to trans adults. Well, I, I do want to throw a bit of a wrench in that and say that a lot of that political sentiment is making its way up here. So we mm. are seeing, and again, beginning with trans youth, because that's always the wedge issue, right? Yeah, we are right. seeing um, protests against schools affirming trans youth. We are seeing school boards react out of fear and start to pull back a little bit on, on what they will and won't do for trans youth in school. We are seeing some provinces, the more conservative provinces, make it so that trans youth cannot use a different name and pronouns at school without the parents being consulted. So there are things starting to happen now. All of those things, I believe, will get challenged in court. And I think most of them will not be allowed to continue. They'll get struck down. And that is because of, thankfully, both the federal rules that that where we are a protected class and also all the provinces have their own protections for trans people. So I think over time, we're going to see those get struck down, but it is, it, it is, it is here. It is definitely here. And um, we have even the, uh, the leader of the conservative party of Canada here has been talking about gender ideology. So to make no mistake, uh, you mm -hmm. know, anti-trans sentiment is alive and well in Canada. I'm sorry to hear that. Once that momentum starts, it's really hard to stop. And at least here in the States, I think we dropped the ball and we let them get that toehold. Yeah, it's frightening. I, I know that the Southern Poverty Law Center just released a report um, showing how all of these um, right wing groups are working together and mm -hmm. and transphobic groups are working together to uh, to to turn trans people into that wedge issue and ultimately get a foothold 
into auton- body autonomy overall. It's frightening. It's really frightening. And I, I've been following it very closely. And and my heart is is with trans people in the US right now. And I I, I certainly hope there continue to be safe havens available for for you, uh, depending on on the states that you live in. And I know people go, well, just move out of that state. It's not that easy, right? It is not that easy to move. I don't know where people get this idea that it, you know everyone can just pick up and leave. Just pack up and go. Well, uh, one of my upcoming episodes is with a real estate uh, person here in Connecticut. And, and that's what we're talking about is the fact that, yes, Connecticut is a sanctuary state for families with trans kids trans kids it is a sanctuary state for reproductive autonomy but nobody can afford to live here there is no rent available anywhere in connecticut that is cheaper than what i'm paying a month for a mortgage getting a job once you get here all of these things form realistic impediments to what in theory is meant to be supportive and so we're definitely going to be exploring that a little bit more because it's you know, the harsh reality behind the the legal protection. Well, that's that's very similar to here in the sense that, you know, um, I now live in Toronto, which is the largest city in Canada and uh, and fourth largest in North America, by the way, I found out um, after New York, L.A. and Chicago. But it is also a very queer friendly city. I mean, it, it very overall is a is a very. I don't want to say entirely say people will have their stories for sure, but overall a very safe place to live if you're LGBTQ. But good luck being able to afford to live here. The rents are ridiculous. And, you know, Zoe and I sold our home in Ottawa and made a profit off of it. And we still can't afford to buy in Toronto. So there's no way we're going to be buying here. Um, and then renting is its own nightmare. So yeah, it's it's very similar, yeah. right? A lot of the places that are safer, places like, you know, New York, places like Connecticut, places like, you know, Boston, yeah. places like they're they're not affordable for a lot of people. So yeah, I'll be really interested to to listen to that one. I'm I'm looking forward to it. We've been talking for an hour, and I am just now noticing that there's a TARDIS on your back wall. <laughs> I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if if things get really bad, we can just hop in and go to another place, time because yeah. the doctor the doctor seems to get us. Oh, the doctor gets us for sure, especially one particular doctor who we all yes. love. <laughs> We all love him. We all love David Tennant. Can I just say yes. that? David Tennant is is just everyone's true love as far as I'm concerned, including mine. And I'm not even any really into dudes, but David Tennant in a heartbeat. I love that guy. If he, if he um, came yeah, knocking no, it's, on the it's, door. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm excited for the new doctor. I I got to watch the new special that introduced him, and uh, I I'm very happy. But yeah, David, the whole story of David Tennant and the the trans TARDIS pin has been has been carrying me through. Christmas is not my favorite time of year, and this this story has been giving me a bit of hope. So thank That's you, wonderful. David Tennant. Thank you, David Tennant. Thank you for the joy. Yes, yeah, good man. Rowan, I thank you so much for your time. This uh, talking with you has been wonderful. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it is it's been a it's been a wonderful hour. It really has. It's been it's been great talking to you. And uh, and I just want to say as well to to everybody who might be listening. I, I've said it already, but I want to say it again that if things feel really hard right now. And I know, especially around the holidays, things can feel really hard for queer people, you know, in particular, if you don't have family to spend the holidays with, or if your family is, is uh, less than supportive, shall we say, you know, you never know what's around the corner for you. And my life today is rich in a way that I never saw coming in 2020. It is an, an incredible life and it is, it is full of of moments where I just sit here and go and I want to pinch myself because it is just so lovely and not at all what I expected. So don't give up on yourself. You are innately worthy of love and support. You are innately a 
person who deserves to be loved and deserves to love yourself. So please hold on and get the help that you need and reach out to people when you need to and accept the help when it is offered. Quick update on the presentation that I'm working on with Tony Ferriolo of Healthcare Advocates International. Alex Inc., the group that we're working for, needed to reschedule the event. And as of this recording, I don't know the new date. But as soon as I know, I'll get word out to you via social media. I'm sure Tony and Alex Inc. will as well. As we begin a new calendar year, I wanted to encourage perhaps beg listeners to leave comments. Are there topics that you want to know more about? Is there somebody, maybe yourself, that you think would make a good guest? Please let me know. Sometimes working on this show feels a little isolating. And as the philosopher from the great state of New Jersey has repeatedly asked, Is there anybody alive? This is Sadie McCarthy. I'm Claire Sneese. And you've just been listening to TransCat. It is made by one of my favorite people in the world, Claire McCarthy. TransCat is a production of TransCat Enterprises, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. Join us on the web at transcat.com. That's T-R-A-N-S-Q-A-T dot com. Q-A-T dot com. Q-A-T dot com. There you'll find links to TransCat, the blog, writing projects, speaking engagements, and our PayPal donations page. Please continue. Consider supporting our mission with your monkeys. Monies. Your monies. Your monies. Not monkeys. <laughs> Please consider supporting our mission with your monies. Let's Any go. monkeys will be gratefully received as well. Follow Transcat on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. On TikTok, we are at the real Transcat. Want to tell your story on air? Or ask Claire a question? What is the deal? She has all the answers. Or suggest a guest or topic for an upcoming episode. Use the contact page at the website or email her directly at crmtranscat at gmail.com. crmtranscat at gmail.com. And thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye.